Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Alex Lasky, President and Chief Executive Officer of OPower. Thank you. 135 years ago, Thomas Edison lit a light bulb that would burn for 13 hours on a single filament. His light bulb wasn't the first, but it was the best, and he knew it. And in front of a crowd of a roughly this size in Menlo Park, New Jersey, he declared he would make electricity so cheap that only the wealthy would burn candles. I guess that passed for humility in 1879. But that was Edison's promise, to single-handedly build a product and market that would bring millions of people out of the dark. He set to work designing the world's first power plant. He found a backer, and a pretty good one, in J.P. Morgan. And three years later, the doors opened to Manhattan's Pearl Street Station. And while 400 bulbs flickering from this Brooklyn Bridge might not have looked like much, they signal the dawn of a brighter age. Electricity transformed society in a way unlike any other technology. One power plant gave way to hundreds. As a nation, we committed to forging a power grid that would span from coast to coast. And in return, we unlocked assembly lines, EKGs, electron microscopes, computer chips, the information superhighway. Technology to save lives and make them better. Demand for electricity soared, and utilities like Edison's became the bedrock of the American economy. And all of us benefited. In the course of the 20th century, Edison's, invent just gave us, Edison's inventions gave us more hours in the day. It endowed every child with the opportunity to read after dark. It offered warmth to the old and comfort to the sick. It sparked revolutions in manufacturing and technology and science and health. It strengthened our workforce and fueled 100 years of remarkable growth. But what even Edison didn't foresee was our world today a place where the most meaningful innovations aren't in finding new ways to use electricity, they're in finding ways to save it. Andrea Arvanagin knows that firsthand. She's not an energy expert. She's a hardworking actress in Los Angeles County. And six months ago, on Thursday, August 28, 2014, she helped her utility solve a problem she didn't even know it had. It began with an email Wednesday evening. Glendale Water and Power told her that tomorrow was going to be a very hot day and energy demand would be high. By using less energy, she could help keep costs down for everyone. All she had to do was turn down the air conditioning by a couple of degrees or do her laundry at another time. Skipping a chore sounded easy enough, so she did. Rather than running her appliances, Andrea went running in the park or maybe she met up with a friend. The next morning, Andrea received another email. Out of 100 people in her neighborhood, she had used less energy than all but six of them. She saved a little money, but more importantly, she'd done her part to make sure energy stayed affordable for other people in her community. It felt good, so she tweeted about it. A student for life, hashtag overachiever. Not everybody's tweeting about energy. Andrea didn't know it, but she was part of something big. Most of Glendale's customers received a similar set of messages. And while no one home prevented a peaking power plant from firing up, together, Andrea and her neighbors cut peak demand by more than 5% on one of the hottest days of the year. All it took was software, timely, personalized, data-rich messages helped 40,000 people find four megawatts of capacity savings. My company, Opower, calls this behavioral demand response. And here's what it looks like from above. What you're seeing here, these red bars, are all the homes in Glendale service territory. 
The evening before, these are the messages, emails, voicemails, even text messages, letting people know that the next day was going to be a peak event. And then here are their savings the next day, the red are the deepest savings, but you can see they're spread evenly across the service territory. And the following morning, the messages thanking people for participating and letting them know how much energy they had saved. Data rich, highly personalized. This wasn't an isolated event. This summer, communities from California and Michigan to Maryland and Vermont beat back peak demand during the most critical hours of the year. But unlike any other demand response program on Earth, they weren't doing it for a cash reward. They did it because their utilities gave them deeply personalized information that they found valuable and motivating. If that sounds familiar, it should. Glendale is about an hour's drive from the place where professors Robert Cialdini and Wesley Schultz ran the world's first behavioral energy efficiency experiment more than a decade ago. Together they discovered a powerful truth that information and data, not money, not morals, are the most powerful force to change how people use energy. Give people some context. Say benchmark them against others in their neighborhood and you'll dramatically reshape their behavior. Cialdini and Schultz published their findings in 2004. A couple of years later, before ARPA-E, my friend Dan Yates and I were squatting in a friend's crowded office, kicking around ideas about what we could do together to have an impact on climate change. I'm the one with the hair. Two years before Cash for Clunkers, we wondered if we could reform auto loans to help people swap gas-guzzling Oldsmobiles for efficient Ford Focuses. We thought about trying to accelerate appliance upgrades in public housing. We had a number of ideas. In the end, we decided to harness technology to replay Cialdini and Schultz's experiment on a global scale. We would partner with utilities, analyze their customer data, and show families and businesses how their energy stacked up to one another. And not only that, we would apply our expertise in data analytics and data science to improve every part of the utility customer interface. Consumers would save money, utilities would meet their energy efficiency targets, everyone would cut their carbon emissions. It would be a win-win-win. Many of you know that story already. What you don't know is how tough it was in the beginning. It's probably hard for this audience to believe, but the utilities weren't exactly breaking down our doors for our terrific new ideas. Now, let's remember, our utilities we demand of them that they are run safely and reliably. It's no surprise that careful and methodical nuclear and, engineer and electrical engineers were more than a bit skeptical of a couple of unproven and unkempt software guys from San Francisco. The potential benefits of taking a chance on a couple of outsiders like us were outweighed by the safety of business as usual. So over the last eight years, we've worked tirelessly to prove that our ideas and our technology could reliably tackle the industry's problems. We found investors, we hired brilliant software developers, statisticians, and product managers. I have spent more, nearly a thousand nights in lonely hotels and more than a million air, miles on crowded airplanes. It has been worth the effort. Over time, we found utilities willing to take a chance on us. Together with these utility partners, we have built and deployed technology that does reliably solve some of the industry's most vital problems. We no longer feel like outsiders. We have matured our platform and expanded our services, and last year we rang the bell of the New York Stock Exchange. We had a big party. Today we're a team of 600 people working with nearly 100 utilities in 10 countries. More than 50 million households are using OPower's technology and in the past year alone, they've generated more than three terawatt hours of energy savings. What's three terawatt hours in a year? It's the equivalent of taking a half a million cars off the roads. It's enough energy to power all the homes in Baltimore or Las Vegas. It's more than two times as much energy as the biggest residential solar company in the world produced last year. From a climate perspective, these are real results, but we can do more. Deploying the technology we used last summer in Glendale across the United States would mean we would shut down 93 of America's dirtiest power plants forever. That sounds pretty good, right? What are we waiting for? 
We have the technology, and there are millions of people like Andrea who want to be part of the solution. What's stopping us? What's stopping us is that our regulatory policies have fallen behind the pace of innovation. Laws and rules written in a time before the internet still govern the way most utilities do business. Many lack a clear incentive to adapt and embrace technology that would save their customers energy and money. To put it another way, I'm proud that we can run behavioral demand response for 40,000 people in a leafy suburb of Los Angeles. I want to run it for millions of people in New York City, Miami, and Dallas too. And we can, but it will require policies that are adaptable and forward-looking. We need to fix the fact that many utilities still aren't rewarded for delivering great outcomes for their customers or for the planet. As a society, we should be asking more of our utilities, and we should be empowering them with the incentive to evolve. It's not a new idea. It's an idea as old as the industry itself. Edison rightly understood that electricity's potential was limitless, but his first power plant barely powered 85 homes. To bring millions of people out of the dark, he and others understood the need for a compact between utilities and the people they serve. That compact was forged in 1907, when the Wisconsin legislature passed the Public Utility Act and extended electric service to everyone. For the first time in history, light was no longer a privilege restricted to the wealthy in places like Madison and Milwaukee. It became a service provided for the public, no matter who they were or where they lived. In the Colorado River Valley, public and private investments cemented the Hoover Dam, and in an era of profound uncertainty, gave farmers the confidence to invest in their land, plant their fields, and revitalize their economy. The same promise took root in Appalachia. In the depths of the Great Depression, President Franklin Roosevelt fought hard to bring affordable power to rural communities, and he lifted millions out of poverty through the Tennessee Valley Authority. Generation after generation, America has renewed the idea of a public utility. Public funding for nuclear power transformed the weapons of war into an engine for peace. Tax credits for wind and solar have helped green our economy and put people back to work after the Great Recession. Policy and ingenuity have pushed utilities to build a better grid, a stronger grid, a more inclusive grid, and now a cleaner grid. Our history is proof that utilities can evolve. And all of us have benefited. Thanks to bold reforms, utilities have revolutionized the way we live our lives. Not just some of us, all of us. Today, electric utilities face unprecedented new challenges. For the first time ever, energy demand is flat or declining in the United States and in Europe. And around the globe, rapid shifts in technology and customer expectations are inviting new competitors into the energy industry, from Solar City to Google, from Comcast to Verizon. There's an argument that says utilities will lose this fight, that after 135 years, the age of the utility is coming to an end. And good riddance, because utilities are what stand between us and the future we need. But that line of thinking ignores our past. And it fails to acknowledge that with the right policies and partners, utilities can and do drive positive outcomes for energy and the environment faster than any other actor in the industry. Every year in this country, utilities are investing more than $8 billion in programs to help their customers save energy. $8 billion. And they aren't stopping there. Utility-scale renewables are now outpacing new coal by a factor of more than 50 to 1. This is proof that utilities don't have to be an obstacle to progress. They can be a vehicle for it. Leading utilities understand that if the 20th century was about improving people's lives by delivering power, the 21st will be about giving people control over how much they use and where it comes from. There's no doubt that some members of the utility industry will disagree with me about all of this. There are executives who are entrenched in an aging business model that says energy will always be a commodity. But I know a new generation of leaders who disagree. They share a vision for a new energy ecosystem, not one built on the fossilized remains of their industry, but an ecosystem built on data science, clean fuels, and empowered customers. 
they believe this is not your father's utility. Let me introduce you to a few of these leaders. Jim Maddy, National Grid's chief customer officer, used to work at GE and Hess. In 2010, he joined National Grid to help transform a transactional relationship with ratepayers into a dynamic relationship with empowered customers. Together with his CEOs, Tom King and now Dean Seavers, he's helped people in New England save more than $100 million on their electric bills through better information. When Baltimore Gas and Electric's Ruth Kisilowicz saw American Express using fraud detection alerts to keep its customers informed, she wondered why her company didn't have the same technology. So alongside executives like Calvin Butler and Steve Warner, she built it. Her tool was the first of its kind, leveraging smart meter data and sophisticated analytics to alert customers when they're on track for a high bill. And Tony Early and Pedro Pizarro, they're the CEOs at PG&E and Southern California Edison. They share a single goal, to enlighten their customers rather than lighting new power plants. Over the last decade, they've pioneered energy efficiency programs that have delivered more than $3 billion to their customers. What Pedro and Tony and Ruth and Jim need now are policies that support their vision and their utilities evolution. Because in many states and more countries, power companies still don't see an incentive for helping their customers make smarter energy decisions. In fact, they only make money by earning a return on invested capital. It doesn't have to be that way. They should make money by helping their customers. If utilities had the right incentives, OPower's technology alone could help pull 19 terawatt hours of demand off the grid annually. That's as much energy as it takes to power the homes of six million people. It's two and a half billion dollars back in consumers' pockets. It's 10 million tons of carbon dioxide we never emit. It's countless kids breathing cleaner air who never end up in an emergency room with an asthma attack. And that's just OPower, we're just one company. Innovators in this room and across the country are developing technologies whose collective potential we can't even imagine. They're working to increase the capabilities and cost competitiveness of wind and solar, and to reliably and inexpensively store electricity when the sun isn't shining and the wind isn't blowing. These innovators are finding ways to dramatically reduce the energy needs of our appliances, our buildings, and our cars. But in order for all of us to realize the potential of their ingenuity, we need more than the innovators in this ballroom. We need more than the innovators in laboratories and boardrooms and garages. We need innovators in governor's mansions and state legislatures. We need innovators on public utility commissions and throughout our government agencies. We need innovators at think tanks and at every step of the policy process. We need innovators to raise their voices and keep pushing our institutions further. Together, as innovators, we should be asking more of our policymakers so that they empower utilities to evolve. We have to keep advocating for a regulatory compact that's tailored to the 21st century, one that welcomes disruptive ideas and rewards utilities not just for investing in capital, but for investing in their customers and in our planet. It is said that towards the end of his great life, one of America's innovators, Thomas Edison, left New York to visit his childhood home in Milan, Ohio. Things were much as he had left them. Quiet streets lined with brick houses and white picket fences, aging ports just upstream from the banks of Lake Erie. Edison was a boy when he left. In the time since, he had electrified the world. But when he cracked open the door to the place where it all began, there wasn't a light bulb in sight. Just wicks, wax, and lamp oil. The year was 1923. Edison had made a fortune, and so had his utilities. But in the larger ambition that he had shared in Menlo Park, he was still unsuccessful. Fewer than half the homes in America had electric light. Patchwork regulations had failed to fully incentivize utilities like the one in Milan. More than 40 years after unveiling his light bulb, Edison still found himself burning candles. In 2015, we've come a long way. Our technology has evolved, but fundamentally our challenges remain the same. As in Edison's time, limited possibilities, limited policies rather, are holding back limitless technological possibilities. That's frustrating to me, and I know it's frustrating to all of you. But it gives us hope, because I know firsthand that with hard work, institutions can be improved. 
policies that slow innovation can be reversed and innovation can be accelerated. Together, as entrepreneurs and policymakers and utilities, we can make things better if we try. O-Power is going to try. I am going to try. If everyone here does too, there's no telling what we'll accomplish in the years ahead. Thank you. Thanks so much, Alex. Really appreciate you joining us and Thank sharing you, your sure. thoughts.